Twitter is actually a social networking feature. If um, you're on Facebook, you see those little status updates. Twitter is just 400 million of those a day. So it's a constant, constant stream of this kind of information. So much of it is ads, is um, or news feeds, things. But what actually comes through for us are these really fascinating, kind of interesting moments where people, we read a very small percentage, probably about three or four percent when we're on site reading something. So we read through Twitter. And what we actually do for our project is we read these Twitter updates. We go to a site. And a very small portion of those in that location actually contain a GPS coordinate, a true, true to government GPS coordinate. So we can take that GPS coordinate we go to that location and we make a photograph. So the way the process works for us, and here we have in Rochester, um, let's see, oh, we're right in the Park Ave area, fancy. Someone's tweeting that decided I'm gonna be extra motivated and productive today. And you can see on the left here, this is the feed, we have, um, we have a couple thousand tweets here, 1,200 tweets with GPS coordinates over the past two weeks only. So we use lots of different aggregates. This is Bing, which is Microsoft. Uh, we use Bing, we use apps on our phone. It's all very simple. So here I have this tweet. I can actually zoom in here and see it's the corner of Buckingham and Park. And then I can get a little bit more frightening and actually see where that person right is. I can you know, usually find that tree and go to that site, stand there and make a photograph. Uh, I mentioned the public art installation. This is what it looks like. Uh, the photographs are printed on a vinyl material that's usually used on construction sites uh, to put advertisements uh, on them or you know, coming soon kinds of things. And our, our gallery coordinated uh, with a printing company to get the, the actual artwork printed for the, uh, for the piece. Uh, but we have about 120 running feet uh, of fence here. But it was exciting to us to imagine this thing as having a physical presence in the world, in this neighborhood, that people could encounter it, not necessarily expecting to encounter art, but they might understand something about what their neighbors are thinking or doing or feeling, you know, based on that. So, so we have, as Nate said, we've done a number of sites, um, and we become very interested in ideas of the hyperlocal and of very small sites. I was recently speaking with a gallery. Um, who asked us the small site we'd done. They said, can you do a small town? And I said, small town? We did an airport. So we did a very small piece that's up if you happen to be in Indianapolis, flying through these next few weeks. Um, it's been up since July. It's up through the end of December. And this is actually a video on a video screen over the going down into baggage claim or coming up from the parking deck are these tweets and these photographs. And so they kind of scroll across on this screen. And they give glimpses of the passengers who are roaming through. Um, the people that are coming and going, and their tweets underneath it. So you can see the white text, and I'll show you um, details of the photographs in a minute. But it was something fantastic about being in the smallest site we could imagine, and a site where no one really lives, or no one ever stays, wants to stay, hopefully. There are a lot of tweets about people who had to stay that night, or who got stuck there, but there is something really wonderful for us, and also that we travel immensely for our projects. So we're often asked the question of how we choose the tweets that we photograph. We have, in the large kind of body of work, over 500 images in the set, so 500 sites we've visited. We regularly show 30 of them, and then we actually um, do these site-specific sets. But one of the th questions everyone always asks, how do we choose those tweets? So one summer we decided, last summer we were on, in light work on residency, or two summers ago, we decided to solve that by photographing one trending hashtag for an entire weekend in New York. So July, uh, the weekend of July 20th or 21st of 2012, the hashtag how to keep a relationship with me was trending in New York City. We photographed every tweet that had a GPS coordinate, which was about 23 tweets, I believe, within a 20 mile radius of Manhattan. So you, this can only be done in much larger cities because there's such a small population of people who are actually tagging those tweets. It was an incredible way to travel. We went to places in New York we have never been. This is up in Yonkers, which is everything you say emotionally, you have to mean it and make sure I'm happy and you, you're happy with me. We should also note that we don't change any of the grammar in the photographs. We're very interested in the grammar of Twitter and how people are dropping all sorts of, um, ver all sorts of pronouns and everything out so they can fit it in 140 characters. Make me feel like I make you happy. So be a polygamist. This is the um, this is the City Island Yacht Club in the winter, or actually it was summer. So I don't know why all the boats were up. Understand me when I can't explain and just be there for me. And then tell me, not Twitter. 
So this was from the set uh, commission for the Format International Photography Festival. Uh, and when the curator floated the idea, we were very excited to go to the UK because it's one of the um, most heavily surveilled countries in the world. For every 14 people in their population, there's one surveillance camera. And according to the BBC, uh, for every 1,000 crimes that are committed in the UK, one of them is solved as a result of the surveillance cameras. So it leads to an interesting question of like who's watching? Is it preventative or is it you know, intended to solve the, uh, the crimes? So when we arrived, this was one of the first Twitter users that we encountered. And it was a young woman who found out she was uh, pregnant. And the tweet says, I'm going to have a beautiful baby, smiley face. If your daddy doesn't want to know, he doesn't deserve to know anything at all, smiley face. Love you, little baby G. Uh, but when we flew in, we noticed her right away. And then there was this whole drama unfolding where she found out she was pregnant. They had a fight. The father left. Uh, he was moving out. She wasn't sure whether she wanted to tell him or not tell him or keep the baby or not keep the baby. And from the location information, we can see when she was at home. We could see when she was at work. We could see when she was at school. We could see when she was at the corner store. We could see when she was at her mother's house. We could see when she was at her best friend's house. Uh, so we had this whole map, you know, both literally and metaphorically, you know, of her movements and her emotional state. And this is the, the final photograph we ended up choosing. Uh, and I'm literally kneeling in front of her plate glass window. Uh, it's a row house, so it goes right sidewalk to house. Uh, kind of thing, but uh, it was a really interesting sort of moment to realize that we really have an intimate look at people's lives. This one's photographed here in Rochester uh, over um, off the parking deck at Highland Hospital, and the tweet is, Amy is dying at Highland Hospital, which we found this one to be just really powerful and, and tragically sort of moving um, in terms of that. And we don't intend any disrespect with any of these photographs. Like it becomes a way of looking at the full range of, of complexity of the human experience. And we have a whole subset of these that are based around themes of dying or memorials, you know, to people that are dying. Uh, and it just, it's a really moving moment in the project for us. And there are lots of other moments too. So this one is pretty sure I just heard a gunshot, LOL. And uh, for those of you not acquainted with LOL, it stands for laugh out loud. And it's not usually my first reaction when, uh, when I hear a gunshot. Uh, two, year, two years ago today, I lost my dad, dot, dot, dot. Time sure flies. I miss you, dad. Hashtag RIP. OMG, so my boss just requested me as a friend on Facebook. We've been calling this the uh, 21st century existential debate to add or not to add your boss, teacher, etc. Mark 3, 1 through 6, what's Jesus want to whisper in your ear tonight? This was a drive through chapel at, uh, in Palm Desert, California. Or as Marty mentioned, we're really interested in how language changes and morphs. So this one is, he don't know why I'm hurt, but it's all over his Twitter. Why do I still carry hope? But you'll notice that the, the language itself has morphed a lot to encompass those ideas. So we got really interested in how government agencies make decisions too. And the FEMA administrator's name is Craig Fugate. He runs FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency. And in a speech in 2009, he referred to something called the Waffle House Index in his speech, uh, which essentially Waffle House continues to serve in any kind of disaster. So during Katrina, you know, for example, this, the South and New Orleans can be devastated, but Waffle House will continue to truck in food and will truck in generators to keep the restaurant going. If the generators don't work, they'll truck in propane stoves and they'll you know, keep the, the thing going. And Waffle House as a company feels a very strong responsibility to be able to continue to serve uh, even during the, um, the crisis. So what you're looking at here is uh, their emergency menu uh, for, for a disaster. So their menu gets, it contracts as, uh, as the disaster gets more severe. And Craig Fugate, following the Joplin uh, tornado in Kansas, uh, made the comment um, as to like when FEMA knows uh, how bad things are on the ground, he made the comment, quote, if you get there and the Waffle House is closed, that's really bad. That's where you go to work. So the Waffle House Index uh, has three levels based on the extent of operations and service to the restaurant uh, following a storm. So green, the restaurant is serving a full menu, indicating the restaurant has power and damage is limited. Yellow, the restaurant is serving a limited menu, indicating there may be no power or only power from a generator or food supplies may be low. And red is the restaurant is closed, indicating severe damage. And basically, that's when FEMA goes to work. 
Uh, so to show you how serious Waffle House is about this, this is their mobile Waffle House unit that they'll send in to disaster sites. It's an RV mocked up to look like the outside of a Waffle House restaurant, and they will send this thing in to continue to serve food. So just to show you their level of dedication. But we uh, did this residency at the Robert Rauschenberg Foundation last summer, and this is an installation shot of the piece uh, in the foundation and me barefoot because it was an island and you know you could do that. Um, but we basically purchased every item on their emergency menu uh, using the Rauschenberg Foundation funds, which is a really fun thing to do. Um, and we photographed every item on the uh, emergency menu and created our own version of the Waffle House Index. So they're cataloged into you know rows based on you know drinks versus beverages versus full meals versus you know trays of food, et cetera, et cetera.